It almost can't be overstated how disappointed Deft was following 2014 Worlds. His team, Samsung Blue, came in as the number one seed from Korea. The overwhelming favorites predicted to sweep their way to a title just as Faker, his high school rival, had done a year before. Yet somehow, not only did Blue fail to win it all, they were eliminated by their sister team, a roster they had repeatedly beaten all year long, except now, when it mattered most. It was a shock to spectators, although there were some warning signs Blue weren't quite so unshakable. Earlier back in World's group stage, on their opening day of games, Blue played an interesting match against a team named Fnatic. This was Europe's number two seed that had historically been quite good, but who were having an up and down year. Most spectators didn't think Fnatic would be able to put up much of a fight against Blue, but they did more than that. Seconds for Dade to come up. There's the second makes the straight. Peke using a last Just second get the on him. Fnatic are fighting here. Is it going to go well for them? Is it going to go their way? They finish it off, and Fnatic take down Samsung Blue. Samsung Blue were obliterated by the scrappy European squad, which proved to be the first signal something was wrong, and it rattled Deft. After the game, Deft was seen on stage with tears welling in his eyes. It looked like this loss undid all the hard work he had put into conquering his volatile emotions. It was possible the early disappointment could have sent Blue on a downward spiral of tilt, ending their season with an even earlier exit from Worlds. That is, if it wasn't for a kind opponent who approached Deft with some positivity after the game. I saw Deft uh, crying after the game and I really respect him and I went to him after the game and I gave him a hug and I said, shit happens, you know, like in the end, you, life continues, you will do better next time. And I think he was really grateful for it. Reckless was Fnatic's AD carry, a rising European star at the time that shared a surprising number of similarities to the crazy high school kids of Blue. Just a few years prior, he was in their shoes, giving up his future to commit himself to competitive League of Legends full-time at a very young age. His goal was to one day grow into becoming one of the best AD carries in the world, which is why he found so much inspiration in Deft. Well, I guess it basically all started last year. My my eye catched him, you know, along the way when I was looking for people to look up to. I was a big fan of him. Uh, I even named one of my accounts like European Dev. He thought that was super cool. So he like actually reached out to me and added me uh, on the league client when we when we went to boot camp in Korea. So for me, that like made me feel really appreciated, you know, as a person and as a player. League of Legends is a famously taxing experience on its players' mental health, which is why the friendships Deft makes over the course of his career will be an integral part of his development. Making connections through gaming has always been an important part of his journey, and I'll tell you right now, Deft only finds success when he's surrounded and supported by teammates and friends to rely on. That's what made it so sad this connection led to a terrible heartbreak. After 2014 Worlds, League of Legends experienced what came to be known as the Great Korean Exodus. At the start of the 2015 offseason, foreign markets of North America, Europe, and China all began making such large free agency offers to top Korean players, most left their home region. China in particular had developed a genius idea where major live streaming services teamed up with LPL clubs to create the kinds of offers Korean pros couldn't refuse. The idea was an LPL team would make a free agency offer in conjunction with a live streaming website for a particular pro. The live streamer added additional money to the contract, inflating the salary, all but guaranteeing the player would accept, and in exchange, the site would get to add certain riders to the deal, like the player would have to stream on their website exclusively and meet a certain number of hours streamed each week or month. 
In theory, the live stream service could turn a profit subsidizing these contracts by then promoting themselves as the exclusive place to watch these one-of-a-kind top Korean pros, which could work well if it resulted in millions of viewers joining their site, something that was possible with China being the largest region in League of Legends. I'm not sure it's clear how well this business strategy worked out for the websites, but this system did a phenomenal job prying away big names from Korea. Faker stayed with SK Telecom, turning down some million dollar offers to do so, but he was pretty much the only one that did. Virtually every other big name star left in the exodus, including the entirety of Samsung White. Fresh off their world championship, Samsung's players were some of the hottest free agents on the market. Plenty of Chinese clubs started throwing inflated contracts their way, hoping to convince them to join the LPL, which they all did. For all the power and wealth the Samsung Corporation had, they apparently weren't willing to spend any of it to keep their League of Legends division around. As a result, the defending world champions disbanded, a sad development for anyone hoping to see them try and repeat a title. Deft in the meantime was still recovering from 2014 Worlds. Losing in semifinals to his sister team and friend was almost too much to bear, as he later stated that was the worst moment of his entire career. <laughs> Chiyongjitimu 다시 그렇게 초라해지지 말아야겠다 하면서 되게 열심히 할수 있는 것 같아요. Feeling frustrated at the blown opportunity, Deft wanted to do something about it, so for Season 5, he decided he would make the proactive move to leave and start over with a new organization. 너무 분하고 이 삼성 화이트를 꺾을 수 있는 팀을 들어가야겠다, 아니면 그런 팀을 만들어 봐야겠다. Shortly after this conviction, Deft received an offer to join an LPL club himself. The offer came from a team named Edward Gaming, who were one of the top Chinese organizations. They actually shared quite a few similarities to Deft, as they too dominated their domestic scene in 2014, winning back-to-back -back LPL titles as the clear best org in China. Yet like Deft, they also had a disappointing Worlds, with some rough losses in group stage, followed with an early exit in bracket. In some ways, the two entities were kindred spirits, some of the most talented and impressive stars in the game yet to prove themselves internationally, and perhaps feeling that connection, Deft agreed to sign on with EDG for Season 5. This was a talented roster that had a genuine shot to compete for a world title in the following year, especially with Deft's addition. EDG gave him the opportunity to take down his old rivals, not to mention the opportunity to reunite with a friend. Fight! Pawn had signed on with EDG in the Exodus, finalizing his contract just before Deft joined the team. I'm sure if Deft had any reservations about moving off to the LPL, the prospect of reuniting with his old Samsung buddy convinced him to take the leap. It was always a nerve-wracking choice to make, as Deft was just 17 years old at the time, still a shy kid, now moving off to a foreign country where he didn't speak the language. But he believed this was a team he could help build into a world champion. At the start of Season 5, this new roster hit the ground running. In the massive 12-team LPL, they finished the spring regular season in first place with a 17-4-1 series result, only losing one set, 
and a 38-6 total game record. Their dominance continued in the following playoff bracket, although the roster did have to eke out a win against their historic rival WE three games to two in quarterfinals, they made quick work of Invictus Gaming in semis to make themselves favorites heading into grand finals, where they now met up against LGD Gaming, a team piloted by a star player Deft and Pawn knew all too well. Imp was another one of the Samsung stars that left in the Korean exodus. After winning a world championship with White and winning the hearts of international viewers, he had become such a big name, many were calling him one of the best AD carries in the world. With his history as a teammate to Pawn and a rival slash mentor to Deft, Imp was in prime position to end EDG's title run, and with the way this grand final started, it looked like he might do exactly that. But with a teleport, we're talking about a lot of members. This wave's coming back as well. Now TVQ going to wrap around. That's good damage coming through. The ulti going to look for over The flash has come through for death. Just missed the ulti, but the knock-up coming in. First blood for TVQ as Akon come down here as well. EDG so, probably doesn't mind too much. Maybe now with Akon there as well. Actually just channels the ulti right on top of them. In. Takes a decent amount of burst damage with Akon coming in. Massive Sejuani are going to catch the Mako. TVQ almost dies and Imp They're now has to run away. He's in trouble now. Koro coming in. Koro, can he line up the Mega now? He's going to do the the form, he doesn't have his ulti or flash, sorry, and he goes back in. Akon gets low, but a kill there for Godby. Kori goes down, Deft will follow, and a massive trade there as Ori gets a double. The first four games went back and forth, with Imp constantly threatening to take grand finals, but Deft and Pawn were doing well fighting back. They forced a full five-game series, entering the last match ready to play their best. The final game started off the same way the rest of the series had gone, with teams trading a tight lead back and forth. One slip up or mistake could be enough to swing this title one way or another in a very high pressure situation, the kind of high pressure situation EDG and Deft were perhaps known for choking. That's what made it so special when Deft and Pawn made it to late game and somehow did this. Here from LGD, they're on top of the Baron, there's the teleport coming through, ultimate already in for Twist of Hate, he's so close, and Akon forced the port late, Clear Love going back in, Akon around the side, but Death finally makes it in, Godby getting tanked up as well, Clear Love actually dies as Pawn goes back in, and Mako's not here, and Death now peeled away, but Korra does so much work in the frag climb, but it might not be enough here, Pawn needs to find a kill to Infinity Q, and sets it out, Im gets the kill, that's two kills, Death goes back in, flashes aggressive, Pawn needs to hide away, Death, what the hell, Gets a triple kill, gets the quadra, gets the penta kill! What on earth is going on? Penta kill from the Korean duo Deft and Pod wins them this game. They still have a minion wave, Koro's still alive, and that should be it. What happened? One turret down, EMG are training down these turrets. Can they take out the game? PYL's back, TBQ's back as well. Imp is going in with EDG. They're committing, they want to go for the Nexus. They take it out. The once and future kings ascend again to the throne. EDG, your 2015 LPL Spring winners. Deft pulled out perhaps the most memorable victory of his career as he earned his first competitive pentakill, acing LGD and Imp to win the LPL Spring split. For a player who struggled with these kinds of situations, to get the perfect revenge against the star that knocked him out of worlds, it must have been incredibly cathartic. But he didn't have time to celebrate because the job wasn't done. In fact, it had only just begun because this victory qualified EDG for the second biggest international tournament in League of Legends. By the time Season 5 rolled around, League fans had been clamoring for a while to see more international events. The only big tournaments hosted in the past two years were Season 3 and Season 4 Worlds, which were exciting in part because of the scarcity. Only having one big international event each year was part of what solidified the legacies of Faker and Pawn as these exciting star carries that could perform so well under so much pressure. But even so, League fans wanted more international competition, like they had in earlier seasons, so in response, Riot introduced a new international tournament for 2015. 
The Mid-Season Invitational, or MSI, was an international event that aimed to pit all the spring champions from each region against each other halfway through the season. It contained a smaller field of teams than Worlds, and had a shorter schedule and format as a result. But even so, seeing domestic champions from every region in the world come together for an international event was always a big deal, and League fans soon saw it as the most impressive competition to win outside of Worlds. That of course meant it was a pretty big deal, Deft just won qualification for the first ever MSI. EDG were China's representatives going into MSI 2015, and with the squad coming off their third domestic title in a row, they were certainly considered one of the favorites to win. The other team favorited were Korea's spring champions. SKT and Figure had been through quite a bit over the past year and a half, and were frankly going through a bit of a lull in their history. Although SKT won Season 3 Worlds and dominated the OGN Winter Split after that, they started struggling for the rest of 2014, losing so much in bracket, mostly to Pawn, they didn't qualify for Worlds that year and didn't get a shot to defend their title. Not only that, but the roster lost three-fifths of their stars to the Korean Exodus, having to rebuild with a series of players from their sister team. SKT were in rough shape for Season 5, but going into Spring, Faker was eager to make his way back to the top. At the end, yeah, I agree. And Nagne coming in onto Faker. Faker flashes ahead. He's in trouble here. Faker turns. Does he get Nagne? He does. Wow, Faker. What do you know? He's really good on Victor. There's a double kill. Things Faker does. What 1v1's in our What the hell was that? I can't believe he managed to pull that off. At the start of Season 5, Faker was back in form and led SKT to steamroll their way through the LCK Spring Split with relative ease. After a 3-0 sweep in Grand Finals, they punched their own ticket to the inaugural MSI, ensuring the next chapter of Deft, Pawn, and Faker's story would be written at this historic event. The first few days of MSI were pretty calm. Group stage was relatively easy for the tournament favorites as they qualified for the bracket without too much trouble. Because everyone assumed they'd be meeting up in Grand Finals later on, their one group stage game against each other was seen more so as a teaser for Finals than anything else. SKT won the match, but it kind of felt like these teams were holding back. There was a sense of restraint, as if these lineups were saving their best strategies for later on. Viewers got to see that rematch just a few days later as both teams won their semifinals series, but when Grand Finals began to determine a champion, there was a bit of a surprise because Faker wasn't playing. SKT started the series with a mid laner named Easy Hoon, who was known to be slightly better than Faker on a few specialty champions. Eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed Easy Hoon was an old friend to Deft, starting as the mid laner on the original MVP Blue roster before Pawn replaced him in 2014 winter. After Pawn came in to take his job, Easy moved off to SKT where he played on one of their sister teams, now rostered as the sixth man in this tournament lineup. I'm sure he was eager for this series as it provided him his own opportunity for revenge, and in Game 1, he came out swinging on Cassiopeia. Strong. His Annie is as well, which is why he knows how to play against oh. it so well. Pawn getting stuck in the mid lane. Easy Hoon actually hit him with a Noxus Blast just earlier to stop his back, and it results in the kill as Bengi comes in. SKT hit the ground running as Easy Hoon led them to a crushing victory in Game 1. By the end of the match, he had a perfect KDA ratio, but it was only the start of the series. In Game 2, EDG picked Cassiopeia. Led by Pawn and Deft, they came back in a rebound victory that evened the series up 1-1, one -one, with Deft in particular starting to reach his peak level of play, as if he really wanted to win this championship. In Game 3, SKT ran it back with Easy Hoon, trying to recapture some of the magic of Game 1, but Pawn and Deft were now in form, with Edward Gaming absolutely crushing the match in a crazy one-sided fashion to take a 2-1 lead. This is what finally brought Faker back into the series.
over to Clear Love. It's something they needed to get those stats in. Marin is in a great spot to stop anybody from getting away. Pawn over the wall as well. Everything's happening in retreat right now for EDG. And SKT is just layering on the damage. Only able to find Koro here. But I think Mako is going to be a second kill as well. And that is another double kill for Faker's Kassadin. Faker getting fed at this point. 5-0-6. This is when he starts just blowing people up. In Game 4, Faker re-entered the lineup and played like Faker does. Here, he picked the hyper-carry Kassadin and led SKT to a win that evened the series up two games to two, sending us into a final Game 5 to determine a champion. This was the first full five-game set to ever occur in Grand Finals of a major international League of Legends tournament, and with both teams so evenly matched, nobody knew who would win. If anyone had the momentum, it was SKT, with Faker coming into the lineup and dominating Game 4, so EDG had to do something to try to neutralize him, right? Well, they certainly did something. So for all of Faker's accomplishments at this point in his career, the most unbeatable part of his gameplay was his mastery of the champion LeBlanc. LeBlanc is already a flashy, hard-carry mage with all sorts of combo tricks that can make her near impossible to beat in the right hands, but Faker abused her on a level nobody else could match. Up until now, Faker had never lost a game while playing LeBlanc, period. He had picked her 10 times in competitive play and won every single one of those matches. In fact, the first ever game he played her was against MVP Blue back in 2013 spring, where he absolutely picked Def's team apart. They may decide to just dunk him under her. They are, they're going in on impact. Baker coming in, doing a ton of damage to Chunju, and Chunju's not gonna get out of there. Oh, wow, Chunyan coming in. Can he catch anybody, though? Impact taking some damage, Rappel coming down. Again, Chunyan just needs to get out of there. Plop, oh, he gets the snare on Impact. They're not done yet. Impact has to dash away. Faker with the chase. He's gonna go in and assassinate Elise. And oh, that Baker. distortion com combined with the flash, getting him out safe. These are some of the most impressive LeBlanc plays I have ever seen, Noah. Yeah. You can hear it in the commentary. Faker did things nobody else could do with this champion, all of which is to say, the very first step of neutralizing Faker, especially in this pivotal Game 5 to determine the first champion of MSI, step one has to be banning LeBlanc, right? There is so much pressure on these guys. You can be the most seasoned veterans possible, but when you're in a situation like this, in the fifth game of an international tournament that had the number one team from all the major regions around the world, and one pick and one game can change your destiny there, you have to respect LeBlanc. It would put a shock through just the mentality of everyone in that game. It is open now. If you miss those spells, you're in bad is trouble. The Dallas Guard's not as bad. Does he lock it in? Coma's right over the shoulder here, talking to Faker, saying, I don't know what he's saying, <laughs> but if he locks it in, he's saying, play LeBlanc. Bengi's hovering the doo doo. 18 seconds left on the clock. Faker, stone cold oh in his my. look. Could he Come switch on, off it? it? Is he toying with everyone? Faker's LeBlanc, one of the best. Yes, sir. The yes, sir. He locks it in for game five. Faker has never lost with LeBlanc on the competitive stage. Instead of banning LeBlanc, EDG went for the biggest gamble in competitive League of Legends history. The team specifically baited Faker into choosing LeBlanc so that they could pick a series of champions that could, in theory, counter her. Namely, they would sacrifice playing a full AP carry mid lane, instead picking the support-oriented Morgana. Pawn could use Morgana to mitigate Faker's LeBlanc if he played perfectly, but that meant EDG would only have one true carry, played by Deft bot lane. This was insanity. EDG's composition would probably get an early lead, they were built for early games so it shouldn't be hard to get some kills and early objectives, but the team would always be on a ticking clock. If they didn't get a big enough lead, or if they didn't win the game fast enough, they would almost certainly lose in the later stages of the match. And if Faker ever got going on his best champion, the series would be over. This moment was the most pressure EDG's players had ever faced. Statistical category yep. farm-wise, which is what's keeping them back in this game. Right up against the turret, is this the finalizer from Faker here? Can he clean up the fight? 
Koro a little too tanky for the damage they're bringing. There's the mirror image from Faker. Ooh, He's gonna start it. dancing around. Pulls back and Faker's good to go. Koro's Finding, preventing any of that crowd control from hurting SKT's disengage, but it's gonna be Bang put himself right in the fight. Koro's already teleported in from the backside as well. Bang falls down. Wolf gets one last passive control on to, uh, uh, I believe, Daft, and he goes down as well. The double kill finally coming in for Pawn. He's been looking to get something going on the Morgana. Baker and his Soul Stealer were not in that fight. They didn't match the teleports, but that's exactly the fight EDG needed to find since they are running out of time. Pawn are in there. It opened up just a small enough window for them to go. There's Severoth. They really want to fight. They just hit their spell shields to block Baker's damage. They are going to get in onto Wolf, though. Good kill coming from Def. They are still following with a bit of on the hunt pressure. Righteous Glory just wears off, and they go in. Koro's right in the middle with Ben from Maelstrom on. That's a huge on wall damage. The Soul Shackle causing SKT to flash out every which way. EDG is all over SKT, all over the health bars, and they drop everyone but Peggy and Faker. Its teleport plays have saved SKT more than once. Will it be this time again? They do lose out on Peggy Faker. there. Faker comes in. Faker doesn't have that many stacks on that Magi. He's only seven now. Now he's starting to stack it up as he takes down Mako. He still has eyes on the rest of the team. Elixir of Sorcery on him as well to get out a bit of extra damage. Goro finds him with the twisted advance as he pulls back the distortion and he can't get out alive. Marin's forced to turn as soon as he nars out. Drop right now. SKT again going into Forces Dragon. Here's a fight. Bangy in the front. Absolute zero. Gets popped immediately. Hardly any damage to be delivered there. And Marin, he's going to get the binding, he's gonna gnar. That may be enough time, but SKT actually doesn't go back in. It's just kind of saving him for now. But Koro finds his way in. Wolf's gonna be next. Do they follow over the wall? No, they get positioned and they are going to back and start to push that mid. And something I thought I would never see. Oh, Baker, failed, Baker failed his distortion over the wall in the middle of that fight, which really helped EDG push because that's the way they could find SKT, a normally very elusive team. But this is another very dangerous Baron. EDG needs it to win. Here comes SK Telecom. Banky not there for the 50-50. Baron going very low at 1,500. It is going to go over to clear. That goes Faker. They take down Faker immediately. EDG could have eyes on the base. Marin's going to be a distraction, but he's going down very fast, even as Meganar. Edward Gaming could have eyes on the Nexus, and we're 37 minutes in. SKT is going to try to put up one hell of a defense here. Baron Minions, the damage dealers down outside of Bank. Five people alive for EDG. They are one push away from the Midseason Invitational Championship. Bengi, Bang, and Wolf now trying to keep them from being extinct in the Midseason Invitational. Here's the last engage. EDG doesn't even see the turrets. Eyes on SKT. SK Telecom T1 are wiped. The Nexus turrets are going down. LPL's Edward Gaming are the 2015 Mid-Season Invitational Champions. EDG had done it. They managed to outplay SK Telecom and were now champions. The win was extra special for Deft, who overcame so many demons in this series. He didn't get tilted. He didn't choke. Even with all the intensity of the whole world watching, this shy Korean kid never let the pressure get to him. He played like the best AD carry in the world, toppling his high school rival. And for a brief moment in history, Edward Gaming were the best team in League of Legends. After MSI ended, all teams returned to their home regions to play through the summer split. There were still domestic competitions to be held, but most competitive viewers were already looking forward to 2015 Worlds. After all, as impressive as Edward Gaming's MSI accomplishment was, you still had to win a World Championship if you truly wanted to be crowned the best. Unfortunately, EDG suffered from a bit of a post-MSI hangover. In the following LPL summer split, the squad continued playing well, winning their group in the regular season, but they slipped up down the stretch. In the weeks following the conclusion to the regular season, they opened the playoff stage by getting swept 3-0 to LGD and Imp, who went on to win that summer split. 
EDG had still made it to Worlds as China's number two seed off championship points from their spring performance, which is really all that mattered. Making it to Worlds means you have a shot to win, it means getting to participate in the international scrimmages and competition, meeting up with players and teams you don't normally get to see, including all your old rivals and old friends. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Reckless had made it to Worlds himself as a part of Europe's number one seeded fanatic. Although he left his team to play for another European roster in the spring split, he rejoined fanatic in time for summer, which he then led to a championship and qualification to Worlds, meaning he got to meet up with his old friend for the first time since they had seen each other last year. Oh, it's last year. 그러고요. 백클리 선수가 우승하라고 꼭 그랬었는데 제가 우승을 못 했었는데 이번에는 꼭둘 중에 한 명이 우승했으면 좋겠어요. Everyone was excited to see how Deft would perform at this event. Even as China's number two seed, his team were one of the favorites to take home the title as defending MSI champions, and EDG were working harder than ever to make that happen. When asked about the team's training regimen in interviews, Deft stated, "Quote: You practice till you drop." Everyone is pumped and competitive around this time. I went to sleep at 3 last night, and 30 minutes later, I was back up after I was reminded of last year's experience. This year was going to be different. Deft was the best AD carry in the world on one of the best teams out there. He wasn't going to let anyone stop him from lifting the Summoner's Cup, or at least that's what he thought until group stage when he ran into a familiar foe. Next two minutes, it's gonna be there. I don't like this move here from SK Telecom. Take, just play push it down to the Oh, there down. it is! Slash and Deft with the rune present. Oh, the Q lands, and that's gonna be the kill. Oh, not needed. Baker picks up the seventh kill of the game for SK Telecom T1, and just like that, they run towards Baron. EDG had to play SK Telecom in groups and lost both their matches as SKT firmly took back the title of best team in the world. This was a heartbreaking step backwards for the organization, but it didn't mean things were over quite yet. EDG still made it out of groups to qualify for the next stage of Worlds, and anything can happen in a single elimination knockout bracket, as Deft knew all too well. EDG did have a tougher road to follow, though. The way World's group stage worked was teams who finished on top of their group were randomly drawn to face teams who got the second qualification spot. So because of EDG's losses against SKT, they'd have to play a better opponent in quarterfinals, and the team they were randomly drawn to face was tougher in more ways than one. <laughs> Stop. He fancies this one. He's going to pulverize onto Clear Lab. The Unbreakable Will is there as well. Rainovers jumped in. Death has got dunked by the Cataclysm and he's dropped. The Grand Challenge is onto Hoonie's game. In this series, Goro and Death are running for their lives and they will get run down. Death will drop the hammer, but it will not matter. Walk away and get shut down. Rainover is out. It's a double for Reckless. He wants to run down more. Death, his brother in arms, will be his dead man in arms. That's a triple. Hooney finds Clear Love in the back, and Reckless with the rest of Fnatic. They're on to the Nexus, and Fnatic will advance to the semi finals. For the second year in a row, Deft was eliminated from Worlds by a close friend. Not only that, 2015 Worlds also ended with his high school rival going off to win his second title. It was clear who the more successful player was between these two carries. Faker was the name everyone knew as the best pro in league. Deft might be a great domestic player, perhaps a top 80 carry in the game, but for some reason or another, he was struggling to prove it on the biggest international stage. In league, the world championship is everything. If Deft can't ever conquer this event, he'll regret it for the rest of his life, and it looked like Faker might always be showing up to take him down any time he gets close. That's partly why, in the coming years, Deft was about to team up with SKT's biggest rival to build the most talented super team in League of Legends history.